We're going to start with immunology today. So that's what we're going to be pulling up first is the immunology PowerPoint. And then we'll be going into micro. I'm going to give people a couple more minutes just to get in and get settled. Those of you online, thanks for joining. Tomorrow, as a reminder, and I'll remind you before we go today, but tomorrow at 8 a.m. sharp, we'll have our second practice exam. I'll make this one pretty similar, may have a few extra questions, but you'll have an hour to complete. And then we'll review the exam after, and then we'll be going into, I believe, MSK, since it's only a part day then for us to go through content. Thursday we'll cover neuro and Friday we'll wrap up with whatever we haven't hit. So that's kind of the schedule for the week. We're gonna do um, a dichotomous key later in the second half. So that's why I have markers and stuff. But feel free if you're if you want to draw a doodle or anything like that. I have markers and paper. And then all of the recordings have been posted on the Moodle page. If they play, if they have funny issues playing, you can go on my YouTube channel. I have um, an NPLEX playlist now for the review videos. And I'll keep those up through the rest of the summer through your exam. Then probably after your exam, I'll take them down. Um, so if you try to access them in the fall, they likely won't be there. Um, they'll just be private though. So if you end up wanting them in the future, let me know. I can give you the link. Not that you would need it or want it, because you all are going to pass. You'll never have to watch this again. <laughs> I did have two, two really good questions that came in over the weekend that I'm going to go through um, just really quick while we're waiting for people to come in. The first one was, do I need to know lab values specifically? And the NPLEX isn't going to make you know the exact lab value um, it's for NPLEX 1 or NPLEX 2, but you might need to understand ranges. So recognizing a white blood cell count of 12 is elevated, or recognizing a GFR of 40 is decreased. So having some knowledge of some general lab ranges and knowing when they're significantly abnormal may help you. Uh, things that I commonly see would be white blood cell count being up or down, Red blood cells, so um, hemoglobin being lower, so concerns for anemia. Uh, things like GFR being decreased. Maybe some electrolytes, but a lot of times they'll quantify saying you see hyperkalemia with a potassium of four point whatever or 5.1. So a lot of times they will quantify um, lab values. I don't think it's something that's important to commit to memory. But if you are able to have kind of a general idea of when something's too high or too low, that will help. But don't waste your brain space if you have no clue. Not worth it. The other great question I got was about um, diabetic glomerulonephropathy. Okay, <laughs> it's morning. And why does GFR increase in that condition versus decrease? So we think about diabetes. A complication of diabetes is chronic kidney disease, but initially in diabetic nephropathy, what will happen is you'll see an increase in GFR initially, and that's because the body has excess sugar, hyperglycemia. It's going to push that blood then through the kidney at a faster rate to try to filter out sugar quicker. What happens then over time is sugar sticky, right? Sugar sticky, it's gonna damage that basement membrane, damage the podocytes as filtration's occurring. That's then gonna to lead to sclerosis. We see then damage and breakthrough in that filtration system, which is why we see proteinuria, elevated protein in the urine. Normally we keep all of our protein in the body. And then over time, instead of having an increase in GFR, we get a decrease with chronic kidney disease. The increase though initially is because the body is sensing that it's not doing as good of a job filtering out in things and out things because we're seeing damage that basement membrane. So what happens is the body will constrict the afferent arterial, the blood flow going into the nephron so that it can push blood flow through faster. 
So it's not as much blood volume going through because it's constricted, but it's going through at a quicker rate because it's again, it's trying to maintain its GFR at that same state, even though filtration is not as effective. So that's why you'll see a temporary increase of about 10 to 25% of GFR at the beginning of a diabetic nephropathy. Then over time, that could be quick, it could be over the course of 10 to 20 years, you'll see a long-term decrease in GFR because filtration, the kidney cannot compensate. It cannot constrict that arterial enough to maintain the same GFR as it did when it was a healthy membrane. Does that help kind of explain why that's different? So ultimately, yes, there's a, a, a transient increase in GFR because of vasoconstriction to try to push blood through at the same rate, even though they're starting to see damage to the membrane. And then that leads to long-term chronic kidney disease with a decreased GFR filtration rates. Those are really good questions. If you have other questions and you don't feel comfortable asking them in class, feel free to send me an email or you can post them on the Moodle page. I'll respond back directly to you, but if it's a good enough question, I'll bring it up into class if I think that multiple people might have the same question or same confusion. All right, so today is our day. We're gonna go into immunology and micro. There are a lot of um, very specific immunology questions, micro questions on this test. A lot of things with cytokines and immune sig signaling cells and hypersensitivity reactions, some immune conditions, which we'll talk about today, and then all the different bugs. So the second half today, we're gonna look at all of our different bacterias, viruses, fungi, parasites, and we're gonna create a dichotomous key for a bacteria to help as a memory tool, help you be able to kind of suss out gram positives, gram negatives, catalase positive, what is that? Aerobic, anaerobic, facultative anaerobe, all of those good things that we try not to remember, we get to for the enzymes. All right, so the key players of the immune system. So this will probably take the first half, but we'll, we'll break every hour like we normally do. So keep me honest, if it gets towards nine o'clock hour and I haven't given you a break, tell me. I don't want us to fall asleep on a Monday morning. But when we look at our immune system, we're gonna do a little anatomy review. So there's primary and secondary organs or anatomical structures of the immune system, the immunologic system. Our primaries would be bone marrow and the thymus. Bone marrow, you think of B cell maturation, thymus T cell maturation. Our secondary organs is the spleen, lymph nodes, tonsils, and pyre patches in the gut. And lymph nodes are especially important. We'll talk about the anatomy of a lymph node here in a minute, because there's in the lymph node, you actually have some filtration occurring by your macrophages. It helps promote circulation of our B and T cells and helps our body respond to any immune cell activation. Overall, all these organs as a whole is just helping our immune cells interact with whatever antigen the body is facing, whether it's a bacteria, a virus, an allergen, et cetera. So looking into a lymph node a little bit closer, recognizing these three layers, the follicular or follicle, paracortex, and medulla will be important for, an for anatomy purposes. We can see medulla here located internally. Where's my paracortex, so here's my cortex here, located right in this region, and then paracortex, I don't know if I have that on this slide, but we can also see the trabecula within our capsule around and our blood flow and our lymph flow in and out. The main reason why I want to suss out these different locations is the follicle or the follicular area of a lymph node is where our B cells are localized and proliferate versus the paracortex region is where our T cells tend to hang out. And in DeGeorge syndrome, which is a condition you need to know, you'll see an underdeveloped area of the paracortex of the lymph node. So then T cell issues, which we'll talk about what are our different T cells, T, cells, T cell issues can occur in that condition. You also can see enlargement of the paracortex area in extreme cellular response, which it doesn't actually have to be extreme. When we have lymphadenopathy, that's when that area is enlarging, right? Which happens commonly when we're having a, a, some type of immune response. Epstein-Barr, we think about with mono, right? Very swollen lymph nodes, things like that. So 
This next page is all about, next few is all about lymph drainage. I'm not going to read these slides to you because there is a lot here. But what I want you to, if you're going to try to kind of commit some of this to memory, what I want you to not do is don't just memorize this table, understand what it's talking about. So recognize, okay, our submandibular submental lymph nodes under here, that makes sense that they're going to drain the structures closest to it, right? We don't have to do direct memorization to say, okay, if they're right underneath the jaw, it's probably going to be oral cavity, tongue, lower lip. And so then if there's a malignancy, that's going to be our pathology. So some of these are very direct related associations. So those ones I'm not going to go through. Some interesting ones though is our deep cervical chain. Okay, so deep cervical chain in our neck associated with Kawasaki disease. So those, those type of connections where you can't easily make it anatomically, those are the ones I want you to try to commit to memory. Make a flashcard or understand. Our supra, supraclavicular, this one is interesting just because on the right side versus the left side depends on where you're actually having a potential malignancy or issue. So our supraclavicular and lymph nodes right in our clavicle area, our right side is located with our, our right side is associated with left Virchow's node. Okay. Our left side is associated with the abdomen or the pelvis. All are associated with a potential malignancy or growth of the thorax, abdomen, or pelvis. This one often trips people up. The supraclavicular nodes being associated with GI or pelvic issues, a lot of people end up saying breast. That's your axillary. So I've seen that question on the NPLEX a couple times, asking about a supraclavicular lymph node enlargement and asking what structures or what type of malignancy would you be concerned about and having breast tissue, um, maybe something in the chest, uh, maybe something in like upper area in the neck, and then having a GI or a pelvic pathology. And they're really trying to see if you know that association between supraclavicular and abdominal and pelvis. Your mediastinal and your hilar lymph nodes, uh, anything thinking about the lungs. So TB, sarcoidosis, lung cancer. Axillary, we already talked about with breast. Epitrochlear, that one's interesting. Kind of right in the arm above the elbow. Okay, epitrochlear nodes. This one, secondary syphilis is a common association. There's also some types of cancer that can be associated with epitrochlear nodes. Celiac, superior and inferior mesenteric, that makes sense. These are all GI related conditions that they're associated with. Your paraaortic. This one I like because it's a pair of, right? So paraaortic pair of testes, ovaries, kidneys, fallopian tubes, and then the uterus. So all the things that have pairs is your paraaortic lymph nodes. And it's metastasis of those regions. And then the last interesting one is STIs or STDs and cellulitis, which makes sense associated with those inguinal kind of regions or iliac regions lymph nodes, which makes sense closest to the pelvic region. So recognizing, just being able to do some direct association, if you need to memorize some, I would say deep cervical and Kawasaki, your supraclavicular, knowing it's the abdomen pelvis, and then your epitrochlear, having that connection with secondary syphilis. Those are the only ones that don't make logical anatomical sense. So then we get to our next organ of the lymph or the immune system, and it's our spleen. And I included a video today in the, in the PowerPoint or in the PDF. I don't know if it actually shows for y'all. So I'll post it on Moodle. It's a silly video. We're not going to watch it. It's a music video. But what does the spleen do? Have any of you ever seen that one before? No? Okay. I'll play like a minute of it or something, and then we'll, we'll move on. But it contains no actual helpful information. So it's not something we'll actually watch during class. But um, it's what happens when med students have too much time on their hands. <laughs> scary, scary uh, parodies occur. Um, anyways, the your anatomy of your spleen, leftover quadrant of your abdomen. So in, if you're trying to write it into words, it's going to be anterior and lateral to your kidney, right? So your kidney is more retroperitoneal to your spleen. You're going to have this lymphatic sheath that covers it where your T cells are occurring. Your follicle is where your B cells are occurring which again, we remember our lymph nodes in the follicle structure is where our B cells occurred there too. So in both the spleen and your lymph nodes in the follicular layer 
is where B cells are, which is great. We love when the same association happens more than once. And then this marginal zone, which just means in between, that's where you're going to see your macrophages and specialized B cells. So think about B cells that have actually matured and have a specialized function. So these could be full grown antibodies. These could be B cells that are antigen presenting cells, things that are going to go out, attach to those antigens, and then show them to other lymphocytes. So there's big debates about what does the spleen do, right? People for years have been trying to figure this out because we can remove it. And this is the video I'm referring to, but we can remove it and we can still live without it, right? So any organ we can remove and live with, we're like, well, what is it doing? And so if you think about, okay, well, what does it do? When we remove it, think about what happens. When you remove it, you're gonna see decreased IgM antibodies, which we'll talk about decreased complement activation, which is part of your innate immune system, decreased then C3B, that's a specific um, part, a specific complement molecule. So decreased C3B opsonization. Opsonization is that tagging of those cells before phagocytosis, before the antigen or cell gets eaten, right, by a macrophage. And then therefore, then you're going to have increased susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. Encapsulated organisms, as we'll learn when we do our microsection, pneumococci, Hib, meningococci, anything that has a capsule, that's a preventative mechanism to avoid phagocytosis. So any, any bacteria that has a capsule on it needs to be opsonized, essentially covered with this kind of goo and tag prior to it being able to be phagocytosed. So if you're not able to do opsonization, then you're going to have less likely ability to eliminate these encapsulated organs. Not impossible, but less likely. So you're going to be more susceptible. You're going to be immunodeficient or immunocompromised, potentially. And microscopically, when you remove a spleen, you're going to find some interesting findings. So how will jolly bodies, target cells, thrombocytosis, lymphocytosis? I put these on here just so that you have that um, connection. These cells can be found in other things too, but they're associated with a spleen that's been removed or spleen that's decreased in its ability to function, right? We're gonna move forward. During our break, I will pull up the video. So then you can, if people wanna watch it, they can. If not, you don't have to be subjected to it. So the thymus, the thymus is like our, our last real anatomical structure we'll look at before we move into function of the immune system. And the thymus is that tricky organ because it goes away as we move into uh, adolescence and adulthood. This little, bit, this little image here kind of shows where it's located kind of right in our chest wall. And so if you were going to describe that in words, anterior, superior, it's a mediastinum location. So medial and towards the front and up in your chest wall. It's an encapsulated organ, so it does have a, a tissue structure around it. If we think about some embryology, this is where lots of embryologic uh, questions will come in for the immune system because the thymus is an organ that disappears or goes away or atrophies as we age. So when we can talk about it when we're younger and developing, right? So the thymus epithelium component of the thymus itself is just derived from your third pharyngeal pouch, which is endoderm versus the lymphocytes that come from the thymus are associated with mesoderm, okay? So that's an important differentiation. The actual epithelial cells, the epithelium, the tissue itself comes from the endoderm versus your thymic lymphocytes, the lymph cells that come from the thymus, are, they, their embryological origin is mesoderm. So microscopically in your cortex, you're going to see immature T cells versus the medulla. You'll see mature T cells. So they mature as they move from cortex to medulla. And then there's this other structure microscopically called Hussol corpuscles. And those are going to contain epithelial reticular cells. The purpose of the thymus cell at its core is T cell differentiation and maturation. And the major pathologies you should have in your head with the thymus would be any thymoma, a growth associated with the thymus, and myasthenia gravis being the main condition that you'll see this in on your NPLEG study guide. 
superior, Vena, superior Vena cava syndrome, pure red cell aplasia, good syndrome, different in good postures. Okay. So myasthenia gravis is the one that's actually on your study guide that's associated with thymoma. All right. So that's the general anatomy. Now we're going to get more into cellular anatomy. The immune, cell, the immune system is really a system made up of different types of cells with different functions. So first, before we can understand what these different functions and different cells do specifically, we need to understand the differences between innate and adaptive immunity. So we'll be referring to these both throughout. And there's different players. So your cellular components, your cellular makeup of an innate immunity versus adaptive immunity. So innate being your body's general first response, adaptive being more of its specialized response to a foreign invader, right? So your innate immunity is things like neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, dendritic, natural killer cells, complement our physical barriers and enzymes that are secreted to prevent bacteria or viruses or parasites from taking hold. Versus adaptive immunity, we can think about it as our T, our C cells and circulating antibodies. So what does that look like then? So our cellular mechanisms and response to pathogens then is gonna look different depending on if it's innate or adaptive immunity. So our innate immunity is encoded in our germline. It's something that's innately built into our makeup. Therefore, it's going to be nonspecific. It's not gonna be focused on any pathogen. It's just foreign invader, this is what we do, the body. It's gonna be quick then, but there's no memory. It doesn't remember what it previously saw. Our adaptive immunity has some variation during lymphocyte development, which means it can grow and learn over time, right? It's highly specific. It develops over longer periods, which means it's not as quick to respond. But when it, there is some memory, you've seen a Ford invader before. Let's, let's say you've had strep throat in the past. Your body record remembers antibodies. If you get it again, you're going to have a quicker response time because your body will remember that bacteria from previous. So then some cellular components that come to play for an innate versus adaptive immunity. In innate immunity, really they're protein secretions, the, the things, the proteins that you're focused on, things like lysozyme, complement, CRP, C-reactive protein, defensins, and cytokines. And we'll go into detail on all of those. Versus your adaptive immunity, you're looking more of your immunoglobulins, your antibodies, and then some also specific cytokines. That signal. For pathogen recognition, so how do we identify pathogens in each system? For our innate immunity, we're using things that are toll-like receptors, so specific receptors that can bind pattern, they're essentially pattern recognition receptors, so they recognize certain patterns, not specific bacteria or viruses, and they're going to activate the general killer system of our innate immunity, which is our, our natural killer cells. And these pathogen kind of associated things that they're looking at are, are abbreviated sometimes as PAMPs, P-A-M-P-S. That's just pathogen associated molecular patterns. So again, they're looking at molecular structures, molecular patterns that are common for bacteria, that are common for viruses, that are common for uh, exotoxins or endotoxins. They're looking for those type of patterns to provide the appropriate innate response. Flagella, gram negative, gram positive, et cetera. Versus our pathogen recognition for our adaptive immune system is actually seeing those specific genetic markers, the specific proteins, and it's activating specific memory associated B and T cells. And we'll look exactly at how it does that and break that down. But in general, separating those two, innate immune response, quick responders, general response, most of the players of our immune system versus adaptive immunity, very specific, focusing on certain bugs or certain foreign invaders or certain antigens, takes a little bit longer time, but has some memory associated. So now we're gonna go into some of these different components. These are different immune cells and some diseases that may be associated with them. The first one I wanna hit is how are we able to signal to other cells what's going on? 
And that's when we, we looked at our major histocompatibility compatibility complexes, our MHCs. And there's two main ones I want you to keep in your brain, MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 has typically one letter. So anything that has one letter in its identity, so uh, B, HLA B27, right? That's a common one, has one letter. It's gonna be an MHC1. One loci, one letter. MHC2s have two loci, so they have two letters. So our HLA DQ2 or DQ8. And I have a slide that will go through kind of some of the important ones to know. MHC1s are associated with CD8 cells, T cells, CD8 cells. MHC2s are associated with CD4 T cells. And how I remember this is the rule of eight, which we'll see later. So rule of eight, so great, rule of eight. So our MHC1 associated with CD8, one times eight equals eight. Our MHC2 is associated with CD4, two times four equals eight. Always equal eight. Never forget it if you like basic math. All right, it's leaky. We'll use that one again. MHC1 has one long and one short chain. Great, one and one. MHC2 has two equal length chains for binding. Both, though, their function is to present antigen fragments to T cells and bind to those T cell receptors. So they help identify for our adaptive immunity what specific type of antigen we're looking at. So some specific subtypes and disease associations. The one that's probably the most commonly referenced is HLA B27. You can associate that with an acronym of PAIR. So psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, IBD, and reactive arthritis. So it has one letter. So it's going to be an MHC1. It's going to signal CD8 T cells. The other three on this page are all MHC2s. So DQ2 and DQ8 are associated with our celiac disease. DR3 is associated with type 1 diabetes, Graves, Hashimoto, so both thyroid conditions, and Addison's disease. And then DR4 is associated with rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and Addison's disease. So all both of the DRs, both the doctor or however you want to remember that, are associated with type 1 diabetes and Addison's versus DR3. You add in lupus and the thyroid. In DR4, you add rheumatoid arthritis. If they're going to reference an uh, MHC HLA subtype, it would probably be one of these on the list. Celiac is commonly mentioned. IBD is commonly mentioned. But any of these could be fair game. Yes. HLA. It stands for a specific protein type. I meant HLA, not HLC. MHC and then HLA. I will change it on here. Oh, can I knock it out? I know I can. Get me out. Okay, well, I can't get out for some reason right now. Oh, discard. HLA or human leukocyte antigen. That's your acronym, human leukocyte antigen. So human leukocyte antigen, that's all it stands for, HLA. It is an MHC, so major histocompatibility complex. And then they all have their specialized numbers and letters. The letter can tell you if it's an, an MHC one or two, and then the numbers associated with the specific condition or genetic marker. But these are your big signaling molecules. So it can help things get started. Then when it comes to our initial kind of players and what our response is, one of the first responders to the scene is gonna be our natural killer cells. Our natural killer cells, our NK cells, are a lymphocyte member of our innate immunity system, our innate immune system. So not adaptive, they're innate. 
So you're gonna respond in general to a signal that there's a foreign invader, some antigen that's present. They essentially are using perforin and granzymes to induce apoptosis. So they're gonna induce a cell to self-destruct. A lot of times you'll see these come, especially with viruses. So viruses, you know, they can infect within the cell as well as well with tumor cells, cells that are growing at a faster rate than normal. So they may be told to kill or to apoptose a cell if there's a specialized signal on the outside. So if an MHC, if a histocompatibility complex has been triggered or the cell has been tagged to say, please, natural killer cell come in and eliminate this cell, or if the induced to kill, they're, they're sometimes induced to kill because the inhibitory complex is not present. So they can either be told to kill a cell or there's a lack of an inhibition, so then they kill a cell. So both can occur. And you can see this, this here, you can see they see a tumor antigen, so it's gonna induce the cell or they don't have an inhibitory receptor present, so then it's going to be missing self. And they, they both end up killing the cell either action. They can also respond to an antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So even though they are components of the innate immune system, they can also respond to some adapted um, antibody targeted cell death. So CD16, a type of T cell will bind a specific region called the FC region of the IgG antibody and will tell natural killer cells to come in and kill that cell too. So you're gonna give natural killer cells as your best way to apoptose a cell, to cause a cell to self-destruct. It can happen typically on their own without any intrusion from the immune system through RNA immunity, or they can be targeted to go eliminate a cell from your adaptive immune system through a specific antibody. Natural killer cells in general are going to be released if the site are increased with the cytokines IL, interleukin 2, 12, alpha, and beta. Or, yeah, alpha and beta. Interferon alpha and interferon beta. And we're going to discuss each specific cytokine in like probably the next 20 minutes. Yes. Oh, they directly damage, they directly cause apoptosis to the cell using perforin and granzymes. Yes, so apoptosis can be the cell internally releasing like lysozyme and then apoptosing from, in, from an internal actual activation of these digestive enzymes or from a natural killer cell, they're essentially going to bore in through the cell membrane and induce apoptosis by secreting lysozyme and granzymes internally into the cell from the natural killer cell themselves. So you think of the cat, natural killer cell have a vesicle, it's going to then attach that vesicle onto the cell, it's going to apoptose, the vesicle contains lysozyme, granzymes, so that vesicle then internally in the cell is going to release those contents and digest the contents of that cell that it, the natural cell, killer cell targeted. Therefore, the natural killer cell is causing the apoptosis of that cell. So the cell isn't self-destructing on its own. Natural killer cell is actually injecting, you could think of it that way, through a vesicle, lysozyme and granzymes, which is cellular digestion pro pro product. Typically held within a vesicle, right? Typically we don't allow those products to be within a cell or else the cell dies. We just digest whatever stuff we wanna digest in that nice vesicle. In this instance, they're releasing those products into the cell cytoplasm and it digests all the organelles and then breaks the cell up internally. My favorite way of viewing all these cells is again, cells at work. It's my second plug for this anime-based show written by med students. You visually get to see all these different immune system cells and how they take action um, against these different foreign invaders. It's a really great way to kind of commit some of these things to memory. Um, you have a visual association then but they're obviously, each of them are like people, right? So you have like your natural killer cells that come in with like N NK cell on their forehead and they come in and they actually like apoptose these bacteria with whatever, you know, lesion. It's very violent, but it's, it's a good show. Um, 
probably the best show I've seen for anatomy, for um, immunology, written by med students. So big pieces with natural killer cells induce apoptosis, part of the innate immune system, but can respond to adaptive immune uh, signals and are increased with interleukin-2, 12, and interferon alpha and beta. And we're gonna talk about what the, that means a little bit further. I, we go based on cell type first. We have a stepwise process to get through this stuff. Then our B cells. In general, our B cells are part of our humoral immunity. The action of a B cell is to recognize an antigen and to present it on its surface. It also has a secondary action of producing antibodies. We know that. And then to maintain that immunologic memory. So three major actions. It's going to present antigens to other cells saying this is the antigen we're dealing with. It's going to produce antibodies then to that specific antigen. And it's going to maintain that memory over time. Big, three big parts of B cells. So they're part of our adaptive immune system, but they can, can communicate to our innate immune system as well. And if you're visual, these, most of these pictures are just a display of the development of these different cell types, but it's typically in more detail than what you need to know for the test. So that's why I'm not going through every single mechanism of production, but you will need to understand what these cells do and their purpose and more their association with different um, cytokines, different cell actions and different conditions, which is what we're gonna get to. Our T cells can be our cell cell mediated immunity, major part again of our adaptive immune system, but can communicate with our innate immune system as we've seen. There's two big types, there's more than two, but there's two big types that we need to remember, our CD4 T cells and our CD8 T cells. So our CD4 T cells are gonna help our B cells make antibodies and produce cytokines themselves to recruit more of our innate immune system. Things like phagocytes, macrophages, et cetera. They're gonna increase our leukocyte activation and recruitment. Those are gonna be our CD4 T cells. Our CD8 T cells, we can think of kind of like related to uh, natural killer cells. They directly kill virus in infected and tumor cells in a similar action through apoptosis, through granzymes, lysozyme. So two different processes. So when we go through, okay, T cell maturation, you have your little baby T cell and it can go really down two of these major pathways, which we'll break down here in a minute. CD4s, are gonna be helping our signaling pathway with our B cells and helping signal our innate immune system, creating antibodies, recruiting more innate immune factors to come in and mop up that immunologic response. Versus CD8s are coming in, they're directly going to kill a cell, much like a natural killer cell. But natural killer cells will come first. So if both are recruited to the scene, natural killer cell will always beat a T4, a CD8 T4 cell or CD8 T cell because natural killer cells are part of innate immunity. So they get to respond to anything versus a CD8 cell has to wait till it's told by its adaptive immune system to go respond to that foreign invader. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So we, I think I have a slide coming up where I'm gonna talk about that, but in general, you can think about cell mediated, mediated immunity as not involving antibodies directly, but more recruitment of our other cells involved in the immune system, the innate immune system, like our macrophages, our dendritic cells, things like that, versus humoral related or humoral mediated immunity is directly involving our antibody response, our antibody signaling response. So in general, if you had to simplify it in your brain, Humoral, think about your antibody mediated response versus cell mediated, actually your cells that you're recruiting from your innate immune system or even from your immune system, but it's specifically focusing on those cell recruitment versus antibody triggering. I don't know if that was purposeful or we switched from. If you did, you have a question online? No, maybe. Okay, great. Speak up if you do, because I can't see your faces. 
All right, we will come back shortly and talk more about our different cell mediated immunities. But before we do, this is a perfect time to have our deep dive review in our hypersensitivity reactions. We've been talking about them for the last week when it comes to different conditions. And it is important, these will definitely come up on your exam multiple times. And so knowing the differences between type one, two, three, and four will be really important for your memory. In general, if you wanted to over, oversimplify and remember one thing about each, your hypersensitivity reaction one, you could think about this acronym here, A, B, C, and D. So one is gonna be your anaphylactic or your atopic. Two will be antibody mediated, although I have to say one, two, and three are antibody mediated, but that's fine. But two antibody mediated, very much antibody mediated. Three immune complex mediated, still involves antibodies, but it's a complex. And four is delayed, that one's different. Four is not antibody mediated. So if you had one, what is your non-antibody mediated hypersensitivity reaction to be type four? So type one, essentially type one hypersensitivity, you're going to have, it's gonna be your anaphylactic or your atopic reaction, so allergy reaction. In the immediate phase of exposure to that antigen, you're gonna have a cross link with an IgE antibody on mast cells that are pre-sensitized. What do you think that means, mast cells that are pre-sensitized? Exactly, you've had some type of exposure before. So these mast cells are recognizing this antigen and they are ready with those IgE antibodies, right? If we've never been exposed before, we wouldn't have that antibody ready to go. Once that antigen is associated with that antibody on that mast cell, MHST, we have degranulation and release of histamine, tryptase and leukotriene. Histamine, we think about, you know, in allergy season, our runny, everything, right? Runny nose, watery eyes, itchy skin. Tryptase and leukotriene release are gonna cause more of the anaphylactic response, that throat swelling, trouble breathing, et cetera. In the late phase, after the immediate phase, in the late phase, we have chemokines, I like cytokines, chemical cell mediators that are gonna send signals and activate stuff. They're gonna attract more of in inflammatory cells, specifically eosinophils to the area, which is gonna cause localized or systemic tissue inflammation and damage. That's why with someone who has an anaphylactic or atopic response, you can, you'll have an initial response. You can get treatment, like you can be stabbed by your EpiPen or take some Benadryl. And then later on, you can still continue to have the effect once that epinephrine or that Benadryl or whatever you took, antihistamine wore off. So typically people who um, have anaphylaxis that go into the ER, we give them dexamethasone, a really strong steroid, um, maybe give them epi if they need it, if it's that severe. And then they're good for like 24 hours, but we always say watch your symptoms after about 24 to 48 hours. And if things start increasing again, take at-home Benadryl, or here's the steroid, or come back in to see us. But initially, especially if the, they're given dexamethasone in the ER trip on the way in, they'll look great in the hospital, and then 24 hours later, they'll get worse, and then they'll have to come back again if they don't remember what you said, or they don't start your medicine that you gave them. I used to work in the ER as a, that was part of my preceptoring and residency, so I've seen this before. Not fun. Okay. Um, type two hypersensitivity. So type one was anaphylaxis and HP involving IgE antibodies and our eosinophils, inflammatory response. Type two hypersensitivity is also antibody mediated, but this time it's different than our type one. Our antibodies this time when they are seeing this antigen, they're going to bind to the cell surface of an antigen extracellularly on that extracellular membrane. That binding of the antibody to antigen is going to cause some type of cellular destruction, inflammation, and dysfunction. Okay, so what does that look like? The cellular destruction happens because the cell is then opsonized, covered, right, with those antibodies. That's going to trigger RNA immune system to do things like phagocytose, activate complement, and do our natural, natural killer cells. So we have an antibody. It's presented, it recognizes its antigen, it opsonizes the cell, it covers the cell with this antibody-antigen complex. That then triggers the innate immune system, oh, 
I can take break down the cell through phagocytosis. I can apple, activate complement, which sends a cytokine and inflammatory cascade of stuff. And I can apoptose it with my natural killer cells. So cell destruction occurs. We also see inflammation. So once that antibody binds to that antigen on the cell surface, again, that's the trigger, antibody antigen bound, going to lead to activation of complement, which we're going to go through a complement system here. It's going to then also activate this FC, which is a receptor on antibodies, mediated inflammation. We can see this in things like good pasture syndrome, rheumatic fever, and transplant rejection reactions. Those are all type 2 hypersensitivity. Antibody binds to antigen and causes a reaction. And then cell dysfunction. Again, the antibody binds to the cell surface. We have a theme, right? All of these things are triggered by the antibody binding to the antigen on the cell surface. You have some type of blockage or downstream effect. What does that mean? It means that the cell itself, whatever type of cell it was, is unable to do its normal metabolic reproduction, it's unable to do its normal replication, translation, transcription, and then whatever downstream effects that occurs. So depending on the cell type, if there's a cell of self, right, if there's a transplant reaction, if there's a cell of your own self, that could lead to some type of autoimmunity, right? If we're unable to create that cell, we have our antibodies bond, binding to that own cell, we're apoptosing that cell, we're not able to replicate and create the proteins that the cell would normally create, that's why this is purposely generalized, right? Because it's going to depend on the cell that's affecting. But things like myasthenia gravis, Gray's disease, pemphigus vulgaris, all type 2 hypersensitivity, antibody mediated, antibody binds to an antigen and causes some type of cell destruction, dysfunction, dysregulation. The main thing is being able to separate this from type 3, which is what we're going to do. So type 3 hypersensitivity is also antibody mediated, but it's different in that it makes an antibody, an antigen, and a complement complex. So it's actually three things bind together to this complex. So type 3 hypersensitivity, I think of three things, antibody, antigen, complement. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that, although that if it if you're able to work it in your brain, so it makes sense. Sure, absolutely. Any memory thing that works for you, remember it. But the reaction in type three isn't necessarily less severe. It could be more severe um, because this is our glomerulonephritis, nephritis, right? This is our shutdown of that basement membrane in our kidney. So we can see like really significant pathology from type three. I would say it's less, maybe less common. And it takes more time. You could say it's going to take more time. Absolutely. That would be a, an appropriate way in your brain. Would be type one would be the fastest, type two a little slower, type three slower, and type four is delayed. So the slowest. Absolutely. So your antigen and your antibodies are binding again, just like in type two. It's going to activate complement. And the difference this time is antibody, antigen, and complement all bind together. And they can create this complex, this immune complex. This doesn't always happen with every immune reaction. So these are specific to these conditions that are type three hypersensitivity reactions. They make this immune complex that's then gonna deposit somewhere, wherever it's affecting the, the body the most. When this, when this complex binds, antibody antigen complement, it attracts neutrophils, it's gonna release lysosomal enzymes, causing all the same innate and adaptive immune responses you'd see to any immune, any immune system response but the difference is you're gonna see these complexes as well infiltrating certain tissues and causing localized tissue damage because these, these complexes are not small. If these complexes are stuck at that tissue itself, they're gonna continuously recruit these inflammatory molecules, which then in the inflammatory molecules are trying to kill off the cell, but instead they're damaging your own tissue, wherever that complex has lied. So you can see that in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, reactive arthritis, polyarteritis nodosa, our post-strep glomerulonephritis, IgA vasculitis. You see all these have these itises, right? Inflammatory conditions, because really inflammation, our body's inflammatory response is what's causing a lot of the pathology. It's triggered from where that antibody antigen complement complex is associated. Fever, itching, pain, proteinuria, 
lymphadenopathy or your symptoms. And I'm going to get your question here and say, I'm just going to finish this. And you have two main kind of reactions that occur, serum sickness and arthritis reaction. So serum sickness is the direct deposition of your antibody antigen complex when it binds to complement at that tissue site. And your arthritis reaction is your local subacute inflammation that happens from some things like a booster vaccine or where you could have localized edema and some necrosis and complement right at the site. That's why your arm hurts if you get a booster because you're actually having an antigen antibody complex type three hypersensitivity reaction at that site. Wouldn't happen the first time you get a vaccine, right? Because your body's never seen that before. So it's creating antibodies for the first time. But anytime you have a boost, that's like tetanus shot, that's like tetanoid toxin. We'll talk about vaccine types here today. That's why that one really hurts because it creates a real strong arthritis reaction of antibody antigen complement complex right there. Helps your body remember and makes more antibodies to that bacterial toxin or toxoid or inactivated bacteria or whatever you're even getting injected into you, right? But it's causing a type three hypersensitivity reaction. So vaccine booster or these conditions, these immunologic or autoimmune conditions are your type three hypersensitivity. What was your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's different, right? So post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is the complex, the type three hypersensitivity reaction. Rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, also associated with post strep disease, different type two hypersensitivity reaction, not having the immune complexes present. Okay. Yeah, but both caused by post strep infection. Okay. Yeah, so why they didn't have different responses and don't respond in the exact same way. Yeah, yeah depending on the tissue associated and affected. Why the kidney gets more associated and more mucked up with the type three hypersensitivity reaction is because it's smaller vasculature and these antibody antigen complex complement complexes can get trapped or stuck right there locally versus when areas that have better systemic circulation, things like the heart, they're gonna not directly bind, complex doesn't directly, or complement doesn't directly bind, which is helpful, they activate complement but it doesn't get stuck together in a complex right there. And then it doesn't muck up that localized tissue. We'll see inflammatory markers coming to the area so you can have tissue damage and destruction, but you're not having the same, at the same exact effect as you do in the kidney. Yeah. Yes. It's just an antibody antigen versus an antibody antigen complement complex. So type two, we technically don't call it complex because anytime an antigen binds to an antibody, we don't call that a complex. We just call that antibody mediated because anytime an antibody is going to do anything, it has to bind to the antigen, right? That's how it starts. That's how it does its job. Antibody binds to antigen and then stuff happens. But once we add in a third player, like complement, that's a complex because then you have a third thing that's binding. And so instead of just antibody to antigen, which is just your signaling molecule, now you have antigen, antibody, and then complement off to the side. And so you can think about it as a larger structure. That complex can get stuck places. Is that kind of? Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, at a very, a very basic level, yeah. It's a, it's how large is this complex, and where is it getting stuck? Where is it affecting? Where is that immune system cell being triggered initially? And that's where you're going to see the majority of the damage, right? Now, in some of these systemic arthritic conditions, right, rheumatoid arthritis, reactive arthritis, lupus, that's why you can see symptoms throughout the body because these complexes aren't just getting stuck in one place, like with post strep glomerulonephritis. They're systemic, they're affecting joints in particular, but you can see effects throughout the body. Your butterfly rash of lupus, your, um, you can have kidney damage there, you can have joint issues there, you can have migratory fatigue that comes and goes. So you can see systemic symptoms, but it's because of a complex versus because of just a signaling from an antibody. Yeah. Type two could be systemic as well. 
could be systemic or localized as well. It comes down to what cellularly is happening. So your type two or type three and your type two or type three response, what is cellularly happening? With a type two response, it's just an antibody being signaled from an antigen. Type three response is an antibody being signaled from an antigen that then binds to complement to create this complex that doesn't break down. Versus an antibody binding to an antigen, it's not necessarily gonna, it might, it might stick there forever until that cell goes away and gets digested, or it might unbind if it's not needed to signal that cell anymore. Yes. No, fine. Eventually through macrophages and um, phagocytes, the phagocytosis eventually, um, but sometimes those they'll get essentially stuck into localized tissue and cause necrosis of cells. And then your things like macrophages, dendritic cells, phagocytes are gonna come in and try to clean up that tissue could create scarring, could lead to necrosis and tissue death because you're not actually having functional metabolic tissue anymore. It's those complexes have essentially stopped the ability for that tissue to do its normal processes. Yeah, because macrophages, phagocytes, they're just gonna, if they see the signal, they're just gonna consume it and digest it, right? They're gonna use their lysozymes, they're gonna break that down into sugars and amino acids and, you know, our building blocks, and then recycle that and use it elsewhere. But that cell and that tissue, whatever that purpose or structure was previously, won't be the same anymore. Macrophages, phagocytes, really good for getting rid of bacteria, for getting rid of, you know, cells that we don't want, really bad if we want them to avoid our own tissue, right? And they get a signal, they're not going to be able to differentiate between the two. If they have a signal to digest, they're going to do it, regardless of itself or not self. It's how autoimmunity can occur, one of the ways. And then our last, our type four hypersensitivity, this is the only not antibody mediated, right? Type one had antibodies. They were just IgE antibodies, tr triggered eosinophils. Type two and type three, both antibody mediated. Type three had a complex, type two did not. Type four hypersensitivity, there's two main mechanisms that occur in type four hypersensitivity. The one is direct cell cytotoxicity with our CD8 T cells, our cytotoxic T cells. They're gonna come in and they're gonna kill targeted cells. How are these cells targeted? These cells are not targeted necessarily by, they're not targeted by antibodies. They're targeted by certain actual innate tissue responses that CD8 cells, CD8 cells can also read responses or signaling molecules on cells themselves without antibodies and identify if this is a cell that they need to destroy. They don't need antibody intervention. They can respond to antibody intervention, but they don't need it. Or it's an inflammatory response. In that case, our CD4 T cells will recognize an antigen again themselves without antibodies then they'll release inflammatory inducing cytokines and then your innate immune system responds to that and does the job for them. So both these T cells are able to identify the antigens themselves without using an antibody. They're then able to build up their response either directly by killing cells through CD8 T cells or by inducing inflammatory responses to the innate immune system doing the job. They call in their hitman essentially, right? CD4 cells, call in the hitman of the innate immune system and then the innate immune system does the job. So contact derm is an example of a hypersensitivity, a delayed type four hypersensitivity. Graft versus host disease, a delayed type four hypersensitivity. So your biggest piece of the puzzle here for people to remember is it's not antibody mediated and involves your T cells because T cells can recognize antigen on cells themselves. They don't need antibody help. Yep. So graft versus host disease is transplant rejection. Yes, absolutely. Two different ways you'll see it. That's why I put that here. Because sometimes you'll see graft versus host or transplant rejection. Absolutely. You can also though have a transplant re rejection that's a type two hypersensitivity if it's antibody mediated. So it's something to keep in mind that you could see that as a type two or a type four, depending on if it's anti antibody mediated or not. So it'd be a key factor you'd be looking for if they ask you a question about transplant disease. If it happened quicker, you would be associated quicker, meaning within the first maybe week or a couple of days of a transplant, that'd be type two. 
If it happened weeks later, that'd be type four. Type four is the most delayed. All right. So it's 901, it's perfect timing. We're gonna go now into the nitty gritty of all of our cells, but we're gonna take first a nine minute break. So you can stand up and take a moment. Then we're gonna delve into specific T cells, specific cytokines, their responses, and a little bit more information about some of these immune-based conditions. So let's take nine minutes and we'll come back at 910. And LAD is standing for lymphadenopathy. Yes, good question. If you don't know an acronym I use, please ask me because I will sometimes throw in some clinical charting acronyms so I don't have to write everything. So please ask. All right.
to get everything back on here. All right, all right. So back into T cells. So how do T cells differentiate? How do they start in our bone marrow and move through the thymus, lymph nodes, and into the peripheral circulation? So we're going to start from we're going to start and talk about T cell differentiation, so you can identify where our T cells are coming from and the different types and the different tissues that they actually mature in. So initially we have our T cell precursor that occurs in our bone marrow that's then going to separate into our CD4, CD8 T cell in the thymus. From there, it's going to completely separate into its own individual CD8 cell and CD4 cell in our thymus tissue. So this is where this differentiation initially takes place. It's from the bone marrow, it's created in the thymus, it's differentiated into becoming a helper T cell or a killer T cell, helper being eight, killer being four. And we can see this continuing here, our CD8 cell, its only option is gonna to be to become our cytotoxic T cell in our lymph nodes. And our CD4 T cell, it's gonna become our helper T cell in our lymph nodes, which then is going to be this T cell that triggers all of our cytokine release. So we're gonna look at what cytokines then come from our helper T cells. Cytokines we could think about as chemical signaling. It's going to signal stuff to happen within the body. So if you're gonna memorize one slide, maybe this would be what you memorize is the different cytokines, the different immune types associated with those cytokines. And then they're in general, their responses within the body. But what this slide is showing you is from the helper T cell in our lymph node, what are the four different immune responses that can happen? So these are sub differentiations of T cells, TH1, TH2, TH17 and Treg. We talk most in naturopathic medicine about Treg, TH1, and TH2. We don't talk as much about TH17, but it is a differentiation from a T helper cell. TH meaning T helper cell, right? TH. Treg being our T regulatory cell. So from our TH1, we'll start here. We oftentimes think about our TH1 as our response to some type of bacterial invader, right? Some type of virus or bacteria. We think about having a TH1 response. So the cytokines that can trigger a TH1 response could be interferon gamma and IL interleukin-12. Things that can stop a TH1 response is interleukin-4 and 10. And yes, we will look at all of these and their specific functions. But TH1 responses themselves can trigger interferon gamma and interleukin-2 release. So if I was going to memorize something on this pathway, I do helper T cells can become TH1 cells that can release interferon gamma and TH or interleukin 2. Their purpose is to activate macrophages and to activate cytotoxic T cells. So essentially, they're going to tell macrophages to mop up, mop up the stuff, and they're going to tell our CD8 T cells to go apoptose whatever we want them to apoptose, which makes sense. If we have a bacteria or a viral infection. We want macrophages to clean up the mess and to opsonize those cells. And then our CD8 cells can come in and destroy them, prevent replication. So that would be our TH1 response. Our TH2 response then, we oftentimes think about it as our allergic response or maybe our response to parasites. TH2 is stimulated by interleukin 2 and 4 and it's reduced by interferon gamma. Remember, interferon gamma is produced over here by a TH1 response. So that is why we can sometimes have a TH1 response can inhibit a TH2 response. Now, interleukin-2 is also made by TH1 and that can stimulate TH2 response. That's not 100% accurate, but that's sometimes how we hear those phrases occur. It's because interferon gamma is produced by a TH1 response, which can inhibit TH2. TH2 releases a lot of interleukins. It releases interleukin 4, 5, 6, 10, and 13. But essentially what those are doing is they're activating our eosinophils and they're increasing IgE antibody production. So they're increasing our allergic response. Eosinophils though also have a role to play in parasitic infection and helping identify and eliminate parasites. That's why this can increase also in a parasitic infection. Mm. 
We then have our TH17 response. This one's talked about not as much, but our TH17 response is gonna be triggered by a lot of different things. Tumor growth factor beta, interleukin one, interleukin six. It is also inhibited by interferon gamma and interleukin four. It produces interleukin 17, 21, and 22. There should be a comma in between these in this space. And its purpose is going to induce neutrophil inflammation. So it's going to trigger neutrophils, part of our innate immune system, to go towards certain tissues. It's going to cause localized inflammatory effects. So this could be increased due to a bacterial invader, a viral invader, or even into an autoimmune pathway, or even from an allergic pathway. So it's nonspecific inflammation from neutrophils. That's your TH17 response. So you can have a TH17 response in other immune system responses. So if we're really trying to increase inflammation and increase neutrophil recruitment, TH17 is going to increase. Treg is often considered our regulatory T helper cell, which makes sense. It's called Treg. It produces our tumor growth factor beta, IL10, interleukin 10, and interleukin 35. And its purpose is to try to prevent autoimmunity. You would also think about it in another way. It's going to try to calm and balance the immune system. It tries to calm things down. It can help regulate TH1 and TH2 and keep them in check. But in general, it's going to try to calm down our immune system and prevent ourselves from attacking self, prevent autoimmunity. Those are our T helper cell types each with their own cytokines or chemokines that they signal. So because we're talking about these different T helper types, there are a few things that I wanna talk about specifically our macrophages and how they're recruited. So we talked about how TH1 cells are going to stimulate macrophage recruitment and macrophage involvement. And I apologize for this being kind of blurry, this picture. But TH1 cells are going to, they're going to secrete interferon gamma, IFN gamma. This is going to enhance our ability of monocytes and macrophages to kill microbes. It's going to encourage them to kill and phagocytose our different microbes. This is increased more when they interact with T cells that have specific CD molecules on those macrophages. So macrophages that have these CD molecule binding sites. When they bind to their T helper cells, it's going to stimulate them to do their job more. It's going to activate or turn on that macrophage job or monocyte job. And then macrophages themselves, when they digest and engulf whatever cells or whatever byproducts of the immune system that they do, they're then going to present them on their surfaces, which then triggers a cascading response of antigen presentation. More immune cells get to be recruited. So you can think about for every one macrophage that gets recruited, you're recruiting a whole other host of inflammatory and immune system markers. So why it's such a good recruitment tool to get those involved first, which is why TH1 cells, our helper cells for our infection, get macrophages involved right at in the beginning. Because then they can start recruiting as many different immune system cells as possible, as quickly as possible, to respond to a bacteria or virus. So talking about our cytotoxic T cells, we've been talking about helper T cells so far. Our cytotoxic T cells, though, are CD8 cells. These, again, are going to kill virus-infected neoplastic and graft cells. So if we had a host for graft disease via that apoptosis response. So again, you can see here, you have your infected cell. It's presenting an antigen. This T killer cell is able to bind directly to that antigen, doesn't have to recognize it via antibody. It then is going to secrete granzymes and perforins that are going to go within the cell directly, and they're going to cause programmed cell death, apoptosis. The cell's then gonna release different apoptotic bodies. It's gonna release more antigens into the bloodstream. Those antigens can then bind to macrophages. They can also bind to B cells, and they'll be presented, which can help that antibody response. Cytotoxic T cells, they have CD8, which binds directly to MHC1 on virus-infected cells, which again, remember, MHC1, CD8, 
our rule of eight, eight times one equals eight versus MHC two, CD four, two times four equals eight, rule of eight. Our T regs are regulatory T cells. Again, this is T helpers. Essentially, like I said before, if you need to see the words visually versus me say them, they help maintain specific immune tolerance. They'll suppress both CD4 and CD8 T cell effector functions. They calm everything down. They also, de they also produce some anti-inflammatory cytokines, IL-10 and tumor growth factor TGF beta. So they're gonna decrease our immune response versus everything else is increasing the immune system. Our T reg cells are decreasing our immune system. That's why as naturopaths, we try to often promote T reg. We do so through various different factors, but things that can promote T reg, calming down the immune system, especially in autoimmune conditions. Things like vitamin D, certain probiotics, fish oils, those have been studied. So we'll often promote those pathways. In general, we've talked about this already, but if you need to see it visually, this is why it's here for you. So T cell activation are antigen presenting cells That's an APC. So any cell that presents an antigen externally is labeled as an APC here. It's going to ingest, you can think of macrophages or phagocytic, phagocytic cells. They're gonna ingest process antibodies or antigens, sorry, they'll process antigens. They'll migrate then to those draining lymph nodes where all of your immune system cells exist. Other APCs besides macrophages could be B cells, dendritic cells, Langerhorn cells. So it doesn't just have to be macrophage. Once they've ingested and produced that antibody externally, that's going to activate our T cells. T cell receptors, MH2 responds again to those CD4s, MH1 to our CD8s. So MH2 antigens, they see those CD4 cells, see them, that then leads to proliferation of those cells to help the body survive. You're then gonna see activation of those TH cells, whatever, whatever signal you're trying to promote. It's TH1, TH2, et cetera, TH17. It's gonna produce specified cytokines, which causes whatever reaction you're trying to promote. Infection, you're trying to promote TH1. Allergy parasite, TH2. Generalized inflammatory response, TH17. All right, now what everyone's been waiting for, cytokines, woo. Okay, so four cytokines. These are probably best made into flashcards. Um, you will have specific cytokine questions on the NPLEX. Is it worth you memorizing all their functions? If you like immunology and this stuff sticks in your brain easily, learn it. If you don't like immunology and this stuff doesn't stick in your brain easily, have a generalized knowledge, know the anti-inflammatory cytokines, know general categories, but don't try to waste your time learning it, right? There's many other things to memorize, but you will have specific questions on the test on cytokines. They will be specific, like annoyingly specific. So if you know this stuff, you'll get them right. If you don't know this stuff, there'll be other questions that you've studied better that can make up for you not knowing these, right? So use like I said, it's like, if you know your strengths, lean into your strengths, that's totally the NPLEX. Generalize, cover your weaknesses and lean into your strengths on the NPLEX because there's a little bit of everything on the test, right? Test of endurance. So how I have this broken up here is I have the cytokine listed, it's table form. I don't have each of them on their own slide because there's just too many. I'll try to hit the highlights of each of them for you. But what, we'll, what you'll see is their actions and maybe any specific pathology that I think it's important to know if this inflammatory marker, the cytokine, is either present or absent. There's some pathologies that are important to connect. You could think of your IL-1 and IL-6 and, IL and TNF-alpha as all being associated with infl inflammation, fever, kind of that acute immune response when you feel sick. IL-1 and IL-6 specifically, but all of them, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha can all mediate that septic type response with fever, body aches, myalgias, et cetera. So IL-1, you can see a fever, acute inflammation. It's also referred to as osteoplastic activating factor, which is annoying, but it will be listed sometimes as that. 
IL-6, again, I think of it as just fever producing. TNF-alpha, I think of it also as fever producing, white blood cell recruitment, leakiness of vascularity. That's an interesting thing with TNF-alpha. You make the, your vascular, your blood leak, more leaky. It's why you flush when you're sick sometimes. Or why localized, if you hurt yourself or cut yourself, like maybe erythematous, but due to TNF-alpha, leaky vasculature, increasing blood flow to that area. IL-8 specifically for neutrophils, it's gonna help neutrophils go to a certain place. So chemotactic, essentially, if you just think about it as it's providing the MapQuest instructions, remember MapQuest from back in the day, to your neutrophils, trying to get them from part A to part B, location A to location B. Neutrophils are really recruited to clean up infections, specifically bacterial infections. So when we have a big bacterial infection on a location where there's lots of bacteria present, you'll see a big influx of neutrophils to that site due to IL-8 localized release. IL-12 specifically is gonna help our T cells turn into TH1 cells. So interleukin-12 tells our T helper cells to become TH1 cells. And because TH1 is a bacterial or an infectious response, it's going to trigger then our innate immune system, specifically our natural killer cells. So all of these cytokines can be secreted by macrophages. So if I was going to summarize this, I'd say of our macrophage secreting cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha are all going to be the, I, the cytokines that can induce a fever. A fever response, they're gonna heat up the body. They're going to, in general, recruit generally white blood cells to the area. And specifically, tumor necrosis factor is going to allow for vascular leaks, to allow for increased blood flow to that area, increased transport of our immune system products from the lymph to the blood and vice versa. IL-8s for neutrophils, and IL-12 is natural killer cells and tells T helpers to become TH1. Yes. Yeah. Um, and cachexia and malignancy, um, I believe, I would have to look into it. I just put it down there because I thought it was an interesting association, but I didn't just look into why specifically it's associated. I just know that we can see it more likely in malignancy. We can see that cachexia related to that tumor necrosis factor alpha, but I don't have a mechanism that I can get it for you. Yeah. Good question. Then what are some of our cytokines secreted specifically by T cells? Then we're gonna get to what's secreted by TH1, TH2. So this is not only the only one, but this is T cells in general. IL-2 and 3 are secreted by our T-cells in general. So non-specific to be secreted by any of our T-cells. IL-2, interleukin-2, is going to help stimulate growth of both helper and cytotoxic and regulatory T-cells. So it's going to stimulate growth of all of our T-cells. And it's also going to recruit our natural killers. Versus IL-3, it's going to support growth and differentiation of bone marrow stem cells. So production of all of our cells of the immune system. So IL-2, specifically recruiting in those T cells and natural killer cells. IL-3, supporting growth and differentiation of all of our immune system cells from the bone marrow. Both upregulating immune system, right? So we're upregulating the immune system with both of these. Then our TH1 and TH2 cell secreted specifically. So I have TH1 underneath interfering gamma, and then TH2 under the rest. Remember TH2 secreted a lot. So interfering gamma is secreted by both natural killer and T cells in response to antigens or in response to IL-12, interleukin-12 from macrophages. So what was interleukin-12 again? Interleukin-12 induces T cells to become TH1 cells and activates natural killer cells. So that makes sense. A macrophage is gonna secrete IL-12 which is then going to tell a T cell to become a TH1 cell, then a TH1 cell is going to secrete interferon gamma. So that pathway makes logical sense, right? Interferon gamma is going to then tell macrophages to kill our phagocyt phagocytose pathogens. 
It's going to also inhibit TH2, right? TH1 inhibits TH2. This is one of those ways it does that. And it can also induce IgG isotype switching in B cells. We're going to talk about antibodies here in a minute, but it's going to help us do a class switch of antibodies for B cells. So then we have IL-4, 5, 10, and 13. These are all secreted by TH2. If you remember just that, that's fine. If you remember nothing else, great. 4, 5, 10, 13 are all secreted by TH2. I have some like little acronyms if those are helpful for you. They're from USMLE. I don't know if they're super helpful for me. But essentially, IL-4 is going to differentiate T cells into T2 helper cells, TH2 helper cells. IL-5 is going to promote growth and differentiation of B cells. It's also going to help growth and differentiation of eosinophils. IL-10, you could think about it as decreasing your TH1 immune response. It's going to decrease expression of MHC2s. And it's going to decrease TH1 cytokines. So this could be your TH2 suppressing TH1 response cytokines. And IL-13 is going to promote IgE antibodies. So again, because TH2 response is our parasitic or our allergic response in our immune system. A TH2 helper cell. TH2 helper, so T helper is TH is a helper cell. So TH2 helper cells are themselves TH2 helper cells. They are all CD4 cells. So CD4 becomes all of the TH types. And so TH2 helper cell is a differentiation of a CD4 cell. Yeah. CD4, TH1, TH2, T17, and T reg all come from our T our CD4 T cells. Versus CD8, just cytotoxic, does not differentiate. Yeah. Good, good, good. And then our interferons, we have interferon alpha, beta, gamma. These are all contained here and on the same page. They do have some slight different actions to one another, but I'm going to include them all as one. We'll learn them all together. For the test, it's most important that you just understand in general their mechanisms. But interferons are going to be involved in your innate host defense, so your innate cells of your immunity. They can specifically interfere with your viruses. This is a great viral defense system. You can see this in a lot of different conditions. I listed some of them here, so some different cancerous conditions, as well as some viral conditions. And when they're in too high of an effect, they're released too much, you can see Lots of different symptoms. So that's what's located here. So flu-like symptoms, even symptoms of depression, neutropenia, myopathy, or autoimmunity. Neutropenia, because these are increasing your innate immune system, they actually increase viral response more than neutrophil response. So you can see uh, lymphocytes present over neutrophils. If you look at the CBC, a complete blood count. I had a couple chat questions I'm going to look at really fast. Okay. Let me know if the sound is still cutting in and out and I can try to fix it. Folks online. All right. Antibodies. So in general, our antibody structure and function there's probably two major regions I'd want you to know. There's the FAB region and the FC region. And why this is helpful to know is mainly because it's referenced often in immunologic texts. I doubt that they would actually ask you specifically about these regions on the NPLEX, but they could. So FAB just stands for fragment antigen binding. And it's a region that has a L, a light chain, and an H, heavy chain that can recognize antigens. This is the section, the FAB region, that determines which antigen binds to that antibody. Versus your FC region, it's going to fix your antibody to whatever cell it's on. 
whether it's a B cell or macrophage or whatever, it's going to fix that cell, your FC component, because it has to have the antigen exposed area, the fab region exposed to bind to antigen. The FC region is also what decides what type of antibody you have, whether it's IgG or IgM, et cetera, et cetera, which we'll look at here in a minute. The heavy chain of a antigen, this here, this would be your heavy chain, this kind of pinkish color, purplish color, contributes to both the FC and the FAB regions versus your light chain is only contributing to the FAB region. So if you had a genetic defect in the light chain, it would affect just the antigen binding portion versus if you had a genetic defect in the uh, heavy chain, it could affect both the antibody type, so antibody class switching and your antigen binding portion. That's when you could see questions on these, it would be more genetically, a genetic modified disease, or you had a genetic mutation that affected the heavy arm of an antibody. You know, would you expect to see issues with um, antigen re or recruitment of cells? Would you see issues with antibody class switching? Would you see issues with et cetera, et cetera? So they might, or all of the above, those type of questions. I would say probably one question max on the MPLEX would be something to that nature. Unless if you get like an immunologist that wrote questions this year. Some years you never know. This is more important to understand is the antibody types. So there's five types total. They start with either IgM or IgD, and then they zero convert. That just means they change over to IgA, IgG, or IgE. So we're gonna talk about what is in general associated with each of these antibody types. So first start with IgD, it's unclear what the function is. It's found on the surface of our B cells and in serum, but we don't have a specific etiology. What have I said about things that we don't exactly know about? They're probably not gonna be tested on your NPLEX. So I'm just putting that here to make this a complete set, but I doubt they'll ask you about an IgD antibody. If they did, it comes first like IgM, okay? IgM is your first antibody that's produced in response to an antigen. So it's the thing that comes out the quickest is IgM. Its job is gonna be fixing complement. So in our antibody antigen complexes, our type three hypersensitivity reaction, IgM is the one that's fixing complement, making that antibody antigen um, complex. Yes. Yes. All immunoglobulins listed here are also antibodies. Could there be antibodies that aren't IgS in immunoglobulins? Possibly that I don't know of. But everything I'm talking about here, I'm going to use antibody and immunoglobulin interchangeably. Yeah. So when I'm referring to antibody, I'm referring to any of our Ig whatever immunoglobulin D, immunoglobulin M, antibody M. That's what I'm referring to. When you see the study, they will be under the category of antibodies. When they reference them on your test. They will say immunoglobulin or antibody. They will use it interchangeably. I've seen it both ways written. Depends on who writes the question. So IgM, the big piece is it fixes complement. It comes first. And it's going to typically have multiple banding sites. So when you look at an IgM antibody, it's going to look something kind of like this, where it almost like is this for like starish type thing and it's going to have all these different binding sites all around so it can bind the most antigen which makes sense if it comes first it wants to bind the most antigen possible so it can have the best identification response to it trigger not only your innate immune system which has already been triggered but can then enhance it but then the adaptive immune system right so igm has the most binding sites available IgG is probably your main antibody and your secondary response to an antigen. So where IgM came first, IgE could come next, right? We can have IgG, E, or A. So IgG could come next, but it's the main one. If we had to choose one main antibody to know or immunoglobulin to know, I would know IgG. IgM comes first. IgG is going to be your main secondary response to an antigen. It is by far the most abundant antibody in our serum or immunoglobulin in our serum. It's also going to fix complements. So it can also create those immunocomplexes. 
it also has the, the um, ability to opsonize bacteria, right? To cover bacteria. These antibodies, IgGs, will be all over a bacterial cell on the outside, saying, hello, this is who I am, please, macrophage and phagocytose me. So it's a great option for neutralizing bacterial toxins and viruses. So you'll see this often in a bacterial or a viral infection. And it's the only isotype that crosses the placenta, so it can provide some passive immunity for infants. So if we're talking about breastfeeding or infant immunity or embryologic or um, any type of immunity at the beginning of birth, this is gonna be your antibody involved in that. So it's the only one that passes via placenta. So a fetus is going to get immunity directly from an IgG antibody. Yes. No, they, not that I've seen, they haven't gone that specific. They want you to know IgG in general, but I haven't seen them go in more depth than that. Yeah, absolutely. Good question though. Your IgA antibody then is going to prevent also attachment of bacteria and viruses, but specifically mucous membranes. If you knew one thing about IgA, think about it as relationship and secreted by your mucous membranes. So it's in things like um, saliva and secretions, tears, mucus, it's also in breast milk. So whereas IgG can pass through the placenta in utero, IgA can pass through breast milk once given birth. So we can have some passive immunity passed on if we are breastfeeding. It does not fix complement. So this is our first one now that doesn't fix complement. So it would not be involved in creating those complexes in a type three hypersensitivity reaction. It can cross epithelial cells. So it, that's why it can be in those salivary glands and those secretions. So it actually can cross through those cells. And it can be produced by pyre patches in our GI. That's how where those pyre patches get involved in being a part of our immune system is IgA antibody secretion, which is why we often think about it in certain gut conditions. And that's why, it's because pyre patches, that mucus coverage in our GI, it can secrete IgA antibodies. This helps to protect us against gut infection because it helps binding, decreases binding of our viruses and bacteria to cells themselves to prevent them from actually entering into the cell, infecting and then replicating. This is interesting. It's the most produced antibody overall, but, the, but it's less populated in serum than IgG. So if the question was, what's the most produced antibody? It'd be IgA. But what's the highest concentration in your blood would be IgG. What's the first one would be IgM, right? So we start seeing how these questions could be used. Seeing all three of those questions on the test in different ways. And then you have your IgE antibodies, which we think of allergy, right? Which is a good way to generalize this. It's gonna bind your mast cells, mast cells, which can degranulate and release histamine and basophils. It's going to cross link specifically. So it's going to bind when exposed to that allergen. It's going to mediate our type 1 hypersensitivity release of our inflammatory mediators, so that histamine anaphylactic atopic response. And it, the it's reason it's involved in parasitic immunity is because it recruits eosinophils, which are the component of our immune system that can specifically target parasites. So that's how it's contributing to parasitic immunity or parasitic infection. So which one comes first? Which antibody? Which one do we not know anything about? Good, which one's involved in preventing mucosal um, adherence? IgA, mucosal adherence, adherence to the mucosa. Which one's involved in allergic response? E, and which one's your most populated in the serum? IgG, right? There are specific antibodies that are associated with specific conditions. I have some um, at the end. I have some, uh, or I guess autoantibodies. I have a few like flashcards or practice questions for you. We won't go through all of them in class today. It's really there for helpful for your own review. Um, and I only included the ones that could potentially be asked on the test. Um, there are billions, but you don't have to know every condition in the world, just most conditions. All right, so complement. We've talked a lot about complement. I wanted to spend a little time covering it before we move on to micro, um, just because it is a part of our innate immune system, but it's involved in a lot of different pathways because it is a part of our innate immune system. 
complement itself it's synthesized in the liver and it is also associated with this membrane attack complex or mac which essentially is its way of defending against gram negative bacteria so complement you might also see it has it creates a mac protein or it is a mac involving when we're dealing with gram negative bacteria in particular it's attacking the gram negative bacteria's membrane which makes sense if we talk about gram positives and gram negatives here shortly so how is it activated it's either igg or igm mediated so igm or igg can activate complement it also can be activated by our innate immune system so it doesn't have to be activated by antibodies so microbe surface molecules is a way that the innate immune system is able to activate complement on its own And specifically, it's looking for, when it's looking at microbe surface, it's looking for lectin or essentially mannose sugars on the microbe surface. So it's looking for these glycoproteins, sugar proteins that are attached to the microbe surface. And specific sugar proteins are associated with bacteria. And so the immune system, once it sees those sugar proteins, it's gonna trigger the signal to start our cascading innate immune system response, which involves complement activation. So what are some functions? There's different types of complement. Of course there is. It can't be that easy where there's only one type, right? So your biggest type, your biggest kind of function of complement that I would keep in your brain is opsonization. It can help identify and put those um, signaling molecules on the bacterial invaders or antigen cells or whatever cells come in that's not self. It can help opsonize those cells. Specifically C3B, is the complement type. So C3B is a type of complement that can do this opsonization. This increases phagocytosis. Then you have anaphylaxis types. So C3A, C4A, and C5A all have A. So all of the ones with A, all the complements that have A on them are gonna trigger anaphylaxis. So a type one hypersensitivity. Specifically, one of those, 5A, can also trigger neutrophil chemotaxis, so it can tell neutrophils to head to a certain area, kind of like a cytokine. And then the specific type, the MAC type that I mentioned before, C5B-9, just no, I would just know it, know it as it is a membrane attack complex complement. So it's a complement that has a membrane attack complex associated can help with certain gram negative bacteria, specifically the necessaria series or species, which is gonorrhea and meningitis are your big pathologies from that. So even though it's general, it's part of the innate immune system, it can specifically target certain components because it can recognize certain glycoproteins that are on cellular membranes, externally facing on either bacteria, viruses, or foreign invaders. And that's how it specifically can be activated in these different processes. In general though, if it did one thing, it's gonna opsonize. So it's gonna increase phagocytosis. If you have one association with that you can keep in your brain with complement, no, it's gonna increase phagocytosis by increasing opsonization. Purpose of time, I'm gonna skip through because I do wanna spend half of today on micro. So I'm gonna move a little quickly through a couple of these pieces, but I have it here for your reference. My one piece I'll say about respiratory oxidative burst or rapid release of reactive oxygen species is this is where glutathione comes to play. So this is where glutathione can help promote and help support the immune system. It's also where NADPH is involved specifically. And it's also where we see catalases effect. So who has heard of an organisms that are catalase positive or catalase negative before, right? We're like, what does that mean? I don't know. I just know that I have to know it, that some are catalase positive or catalase negative. We're gonna talk about ca what catalase means when we talk about micro, but this is the process where these organisms can disrupt. So in a normal body, what we're gonna do with respiratory verse is we're gonna create reactive, reactive oxygen species, which then can kill bacteria for invaders, right? They're very, they can actually, um, encourage essentially internal cell apoptosis, right? 
Now in catalase positive organisms, they can neutralize our H2O2, our peroxidase. So they can stop this process from occurring. They can evade that part of the immune system, good for them. So our ones that we'll need to know is specifically Staph aureus, we'll come up with a list of catalase positive here right later. But when we talk about catalase positive organisms, they disrupt this reactive oxygen species creation. They can evade this process. Also, any organism that has a mutation in superoxide dismutase or uh, glutathione peroxidase or glutathione reductase or glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, these are all biochemical enzymes. So, if you had an enzyme deficiency, this process also wouldn't work effectively. Do you, should you memorize all these enzymes? No. Just know that they are involved in the process of creating reactive oxygen species. Where glutathione is used as a cofactor and a component in some of these enzymes. Also, this process is how um, sputum gets its green color, specifically myeloperoxidase allows sputum to be green. So that's kind of a cool side of a side knowledge. All right. I'm going to skip this as we've already talked about this a little bit because I want to just touch on vaccination types. This is on your NPLEX, the types of vaccination. You don't need to know the, pharma the pharmacy behind it, but you need to know how the body responds to the different types of vaccine immunologically. There'll be a handful of questions on this on your test. So we're going to just go through type and kind of body response. So you have your live attenuated vaccine. Microorganisms are prepared as non-pathogenic forms. They can revert to a virulent form though in a live attenuated vaccine. That's why it's contraindicated in pregnancy or immunodeficiency states. They are live and attenuated. They're not pathogenic, but they retain capacity for growth within the host to allow for an adequate immune response. So they're very strong and they're often lifelong, needing not a booster because they cause a cell, cellular, so an innate and a humoral, an antibody response. They're going to be a big immune response. Your typhoid, your polio, adenovirus, varicella, smallpox, yellow fever, influenza, the nasal, MMR, rotavirus. So lots of them. Big ones probably to know would be um, MMR and varicella. That's why they're in the freezer when you do these vaccines. They're frozen because they're alive and attenuated. Versus killed and inactivated, the pathogens typically inactivated by heat or chemical process they are unable to return to their virulent form because they've been killed, but they retain an epitope, so some type of antigen structure on their surface. And that antigen structure is what antibodies, or what this, our cells of our immune system will bind to and create antibodies to, is that specific antigen on the surface. This is gonna induce a humoral and antibody-based response. It's safer, it's weaker, so boosters are often needed. So be your rabies, influenza, your normal influenza virus, Polio, different type of polio, hep A, typhoid IM versus typhoid oral. But flu is really what I would associate this one with the most, flu virus. Then we have our subunit, our recombinant, our polysaccharide, and our conjugate. I put all these together because these all use antigens that stimulate the immune system. So instead of using full dead virus, we're now using one antigenic component of that virus. This is going to target a specific one epitope of the antigen. It's a smaller adverse reaction, so less side effects, but oh, it's more expensive because we're having to pull off an antigen from a bacteria or a virus, and then you're going to have a, the weakest immune response. That's why you have multiple doses potentially of these. So this would be your Hep B, HPV, pertussis, meningitis, strep pneumonia, so the um, pneumonia vaccine. Hemophilus, influenza, and herpes zoster shingles. These are all using not full virus, not dead virus. They take a synthetic component, an antigen component from the virus, the bacteria itself, and they create a vaccine from that. You then have your toxoid type. The most common one you can think about this is tetanus, right? Tetanus, tetanus toxin. This is a denatured, so inactive bacterial toxin that has an intact receptor binding site. So it's not able to actually produce toxic effects anymore. 
but its receptor is intact, so it can bind. So the body can identify the receptor if it sees this toxin in the future. It's going to stimulate an antibody response without the ability to cause disease. It's helpful against bacterial toxins themselves, but antitoxin levels decrease over time, which is why you need a booster every 10 years for a tetanus vaccine. It's going to decrease slower than a um, subunit recombinant polysaccharide conjugate vaccine will. So that's why it's every 10 years for a tetanus shot, but it still is going to decrease over time. And lastly, our controversial friend from recent years are mRNA vaccines. These are lipid nanoparticles that deliver mRNA directly into the body. It's going to cause cells then to synthesize foreign proteins. So we think about this with the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Will this be on your exam? Probably not because it's in the last few years, right? Did mRNA technology exist prior to COVID? Yes. So you still need to know the vaccine type. Will they talk about COVID spike proteins? Doubtful. Okay. Induces both a cellular and humoral response. So like our live attenuated vaccine, it can also induce cellular and humoral immunity. But this time they say it's effective and safe in pregnancy. The reason they say that here is because it's not live virus. So it can't reactivate because it's not actually the virus itself. It's the DNA component of that virus. Now, whether we all agree it's safe in whichever ways, I'm not gonna comment on, it's not this class. But what I will comment on is it can't become active virus in the body because we aren't giving live attenuated virus. We're giving a DNA component of the virus. So that's why the statement is made. But you can have a lot more side effects, right? So you can have, because we're providing this strong cellular and humoral response, like with our live attenuated, that means we're gonna have a bigger side effect response. So more fatigues, more body reactions, and the risk factor that is important to know is myocarditis and pericarditis in increased in young males. So this would be an important one to recognize this risk factor for. I could see this in a cardio case. They're going to include it. I could see them to ask me about some cardiac myocarditis pathology. And then I could say, uh, if you found out that the patient received a vaccine in the last two months, what was the likely vaccine type? And then mRNA would be your answer. So that's how I could see this being utilized. But I put this in my head as like live attenuated. They're both going to be high side effects, potentially potentiated because they have a cellular and a humoral response versus the other ones are just humoral response. So less side effects. Good, not good. Okay. That's the extent of your vaccines you need to know. So then I have these autoantibodies. I'm not going to go through these in class with you one by one, but I want you to see kind of how they work. Um, so you don't have the answers. So what I will do is I'll post the um, PowerPoint of this. So then you'll be able to go through it if you want to play it like a quiz game so you can have the answers. But what's the autoantibody for myasthenia gravis? You can see then it's A, your anti-postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor. What's the autoantibody for lupus? We had to choose one of these. We have some Cs. For lupus, what's our autoantibodies? We have to guess. C is the best answer. It's actually all the above. All the above can be used. Yes, anti DSDNA and anti Smith could be used, but so is ANA. So could um, anti cardiolipin or lupus anticoagulant. So can antihistone. So this would be an all the above question. So if two seems right, pick all the above, right? That's my when in doubt. What about Sjogren's? This one's not a trick question. This one only has one correct answer. B, yes, absolutely. B, our anti row anti law And then the rest of these, you're going to see them probably popping up like this. They'll just have the one answer on your screens. If you want to play quiz game wise, I'll post the PowerPoint and then you can kind of quiz yourself on these antibodies. Um, will all these antibodies be on your test? No, but these would be the ones they'd include if they included them. Okay, so that's why I have them here for you. Again, should you commit these all to memory? Probably not, but if you already know one, great, right? Sjogren's, anti rho anti-law, awesome. We have that in our head. Lupus, we now know there's lots of antibodies for lupus. So if they list the list of antibodies, unless if it's like anti rho anti-law, which we know is for something else, might be for lupus, right? Lupus has a lot of antibodies that can be positive. 
or you don't have to have any antibodies that are positive and you could still have lupus. That's always fun. Okay, let me see. Um, the only other things here, let me just pop this up really fast to show you what we got. We'll go through. We will start here. So we, we're at 10.03, so I will break for seven minutes. When we come back, we'll go through the immune pathologies that I think are important for you to know. Just let's go through some highlights and then we'll transition over into micro, okay? So we'll take a 10 or a seven and then we will come back and head into the wonderful world of immune pathology. So I'm gonna pause the recording here for online folks. 